Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joel Hewitt, and I'm a subject matter expert here at the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, or HDI Act. We are pleased to present today's webinar on impact resistant shear thickening electrolyte batteries for soldier power. Our speaker and presenter is Dr. Gabriel Veith, joining us from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I'll give a quick overview of HDI Act, and then we will introduce him further in just a few minutes. Our speaker and presenter, I'm sorry, two notes as we begin. Uh, first, note that the webinar chat function is enabled, so feel free to type in any questions as you go along. We'll have a question and answer session at the end. Also, please note that we are recording the webinar, and both the video webcast and a copy of the slide deck will be available for download from our website tomorrow. So a bit of background regarding our center. We are a Department of Defense sponsored entity, one of three information analysis centers, or IACs. Organizationally, we fall under the Defense Technical Information Center, or DTIC, and the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our mission is to be the go-to R&D, S&T, and RDT and e leader within the Homeland Defense and Security Community. We achieve this by providing timely and relevant information, superior technical solutions, and high quality products to the DOD and HDS, COIs, and COPs. In doing so, we are able to help solve the most challenging technical problems facing the government. We pursue this mission across eight focus areas, alternative energy, biometrics, CBRN defense, critical infrastructure protection, cultural studies, Homeland Defense and Security, Medical, and Weapons of Mass Destruction, or WMD. Our external subject matter expert network is a critical tool in achieving this mission. And if you have expertise in one of our focus areas, we encourage you to apply. Our SMEs help us provide the military and government with the most up-to-date and cutting-edge information and innovations. Dr. Veith is an excellent example of a SME that we collaborate with and turn to for technical advice. On foot in the field, warfighters currently must carry with them around 16 pounds of lithium ion batteries for just a three day mission. Batteries typically constructed in the shape of a brick or a box, much like the BB 2590 pictured here. In recent years, engineers have redesigned the lithium ion brick battery somewhat to make it more flexible and conformal to the wearer. But they have not yet resolved a major vulnerability posed by lithium ion batteries the risk of thermal runaway or explosion in the event of damage. Lithium ion electrolytes are highly flammable and damage to a standard lithium ion battery can result in a dangerous and disabling electrical short. Armoring up a lithium ion battery can lessen but not eliminate this risk. The Army has documented multiple incidents of soldier worn batteries exploding, smoking, or catching on fire. Pictured here is an example of the BB-2590 after suffering just such an event. And, just as importantly, the warfighter should not be burdened with additional weight if it can be avoided. The battery chemistry and technology presented here today will demonstrate how a non-Newtonian shear thickening electrolyte fluid can safely and efficiently power warfighter-worn batteries. After taking an impact, the chemistry of the shear thickening electrolyte fluid prevents thermal runaway, resists explosion, and will sustain only a soft short, returning to full power and performance just milliseconds after impact. It is this ability to remain wholly functional after suffering damage that will make the shear thickening battery a critical contributor to warfighter resilience and protection. With shear thickening technology, an impact of disabling to standard lithium ion batteries will not alter the warfighter's mission critical access to power in the field. Now to introduce our speaker. Dr. Gabriel Veith received his PhD in 2002 from Rutgers University in solid state materials chemistry, working on structure magnetic property correlations. He joined ORNL in 2002 as a postdoctoral researcher and became a staff scientist in 2005. His research has focused on developing new approaches to characterizing materials interfaces and relating surface chemistry to specific electrochemical and catalytic processes. 
He's published over 160 papers, holds three patents and six patent submissions, and we welcome him here today. Okay, thank you, Joel. Pleasure to talk about shear thickening materials. Okay, so I am a chemist at the Oak Ridge National Labs, and our, my group focuses on identifying ways to introduce multifunctionality to a battery or to a, energy storage systems. Many of the components in a lithium ion battery that we use right now are single use. You have a current collector, its sole job is to, to move current around and hold things, it holds things together, but its main job is just to move current around. We're trying to reimagine that where you use your current collector as something that becomes important to the safety envelope of the system. Similarly, when you look at the electrolyte, right now the electrolyte has a primary function to just move ions around. But what if we could imagine using it as something that imparts safety and as well as performance to the battery, which is where we get this idea of the shear thickening electrolyte that we'll talk about today. So this work, originally we, I called it expire, but that sort of connotates the wrong idea of what battery electrolytes should be. So instead of extremely passive impact resistant electrolyte, we now call it sapphire. So safe impact resistant electrolyte. This is a non-Newtonian material, so this is like a shear thickening solution of cornstarch and water. Um, and so it behaves like a liquid at the, under normal circumstances, but when you hit it with a high energy event or a ballistic event, it goes from a liquid phase to a solid. Um, now, the benefit of this is when you have a typical lithium ion battery, if there's a significant mechanical force to it or damage, what happens is the electrodes are crushed. And as, as the anode and the cathode touch each other, all the energy is released at once. And that energy is released and it produces a lot of heat, which then causes the aprotic battery electrolyte to heat up and autothermally ignite, resulting in fire and thermal runaway. We're trying to imagine something that we would not have to worry about this particular aspect of the lithium ion battery. So in a normal battery, you have a very thin piece of plastic separator between the cathode and the anode. This material is about 25 microns thick, it is very thin, but it's porous. And it has to be thin in order to get the, uh, the power and performance out of the lithium ion battery, but it has to still be str uh, strong enough to keep the electrodes from touching. And this material can survive over 90% of its, uh, it can be crushed by over 90% of its original thickness and still retain its structural properties. The problem is if you give it a slight torsional twist, so if you have it in a crushing event and then it actually it gets twisted at the same time or some other force acts on it, the, shear, the, se the separator falls apart along these planes uh, between the, the, these little web figures. They rip right along there like a, zip, uh, a zipper and that enables the electrodes to touch each other. And that's where you have a lot of problems with safety. So we're trying to focus on when you look at many of the battery technologies, and this is originally developed for automotive applications, most of the time uh, in an electric vehicle, you're carrying around almost 200 pounds of armor around the battery. And every time you improve the power and the performance of the battery, you end up carrying around more armor around to protect it from mechanical failures. And so that gives it, that, that's sort of a self-defeating uh, design, if you will, but you have to do it in order to protect the, the occupants from the batteries. In our case, we're trying to be able to develop ways to remove that armor from around the battery and en enable functionality. Um, so this is a cross-section of the Chevy Volt battery, and so you can see the battery pack is actually a very small component of it, but there's several hundred pounds of, of steel that encases this battery to protect it from impact. Okay. Now, for those of you who don't know shear thickening fluids, if you take a mixture of cornstarch and water, which is a great deal of fun to play with your kids, if you take these two things together, it flows like a liquid under normal circumstances. But then when you start poking at it, it becomes a solid. And you'll see this with uh, Ellen DeGeneres makes beds of oobleck where people dance across it, but then they stop and they sink into it. So this is a lot of fun for you know, adults and children of all ages to play with. And, but that's the concept here. We're looking for a ceramic particle or, a, or a polymer particle that's going to be suspended in an aprotic liquid solution from the, from the electrolyte. Uh, the same electrolyte that we use in a lithium ion battery. Now, there is a large uh, volume of theory out there regarding 
shear thickening electrolytes or shear thickening materials, sorry. Uh, most of this comes from the paper processing, the drilling, the mining, the uh, mineral excavation industries where you're pumping slurries. And what you really don't want is a shear thickening material because then that destroys the pumps. Um, now, most of this was designed for aqueous electro or aqueous solutions, not for non-aqueous like what we're using a lithium ion battery. There are generally two different two proposed mechanisms for shear thickening. You have a colloidal particles under normal circumstances, but when you shear them, they aggregate and form a sort of very disordered state, and that prevents uh, flow. Those particles lock up and become like a super hydrocluster and prevent flow. Similarly, there's another field of thought where they actually align and form chains, but now these chains are so big that they cannot flow e easily. So you have some mechanism. We don't really know exactly what the, the true process is, but there's some ordering that goes on in this particular material. So for this work, we're going to be looking at fumed silicas and other types of silicas. We chose silicas because they're commercially available. They are widely used throughout industry, and they're relatively cheap. So we have looked at, and what we're going to show here, this is uh, data for fume silica. So this is prepared by the flame pyrolysis of silicon tetrachloride, where you take the silicon tetrachloride gas, inject it in a hydrogen oxygen flame, and you end up producing silicon dioxide. Uh, this is a surface area of 100 to 300 meters squared per gram, with a, you know, it's about $7 a, a pound. And this is used industrially as whitening agents or food additives so that things extrude well for like the insides of Oreos. Um, we've also looked at plate-like silicas, uh, diatomaceous silicas, this is just ground up earth and dolomite from uh, probably the cliffs of Dover. Um, we've also gone through extensive work made by the Stober process, where we take this molecule on the upper left called tetraethylorthosilicate and perform a hydrolysis reaction in the presence of a, of a base in water and ethanol. The ethanol groups are cleaved off and you end up forming uh, silicon dioxide particles. And if you do this right with controlling the temperature, the order of addition, you can get very uniform particles such as it's shown here in this SEM. So these are about 200 nanometer particles um, and we, you collect them and you can do easy filtering and collection with centrifugation. Uh, but this is a pretty standard laboratory uh, synthesis tool, especially for undergraduate institutions. Okay, so all the electrolytes we're going to use here are going to use the standard LIPS6 ethylene carbonate dimethyl carbonate salt electrolyte mixture. This is the same material that's used in most of the lithium ion batteries, including, say, the ones in your cell phones. We're just going to add the colloidal silica to that material to form our shear thickening electrolyte. Now, this picture on the left did not turn out very well in this plot, but this is a representation here of viscosity versus shear. So this is a rheology data. So for the upper left, it should show a viscosity that's about 120 uh, centipoise, but then when you shear it, it actually decreases. And this is the equivalent of, say, ketchup, where ketchup is a normal fluid, but when you squeeze it, it flows, and when you stop squeezing it, it doesn't flow anymore. And the lower right is a plot of the viscosity uh, for a shear thickening material, where you'll notice an increase in the viscosity as you shear the material. So this is, a, this is equivalent to applying a force. Now, if we take all the fume silicas, what you'll notice is you get a shear thinning response. So it starts out at about 0.05 centipoise, and then as you shear it, it thins. So it becomes more like ketchup. And then eventually it reaches a point where it does start to shear thicken, but it's a very weak shear thickening. And there's not a significant, um, uh, a significant change in rheological response. So all the colloidal part, all the, the fume silicas shear thin. In contrast, if you use the shear, the, the Stober derived particles, so these are these 200 nanometer, very uniform silica particles. What you see here, again, is viscosity as a function of shear. And you'll notice that as you increase the weight loading up to about 30 weight percent, you obtain a maximum in the shear response of the material. So this, is the, this material has the same texture as a very aggressive oobleck. Um, it becomes a very, it's a solid, and it's very difficult to work with um, in its, in, when you're trying to move it around to do the rheology. And so what happens is as you increase the shear on it, Eventually, the, the, the rheometer gives a little bit so that it doesn't uh, destroy the, the rheometer head. So you see a decrease in the viscosity at, at the highest shear rates. You'll notice, too, 
that after you get to 30%, once you get to 40%, the viscosity increase decreases significantly. So that there is a sweet spot where you have a 30 weight percent colloidal silica to obtain the maximum shear thickening response. Now, when you take the same material, we do extensive mechanical tests on it. So this is a picture of one of our mechanical rigs and we've taken the shear thickening material that's been on a battery separator and the blue dots on the lower left plot indicate a, the shear response of a normal separator without any colloidal particles on it. When you take the red data set, that is, a, uh, that is now the same separator material loaded with about 20 weight percent of the colloidal particles. And what you'll notice here is as you shear it, this is increasing the viscosity by, several, by orders of magnitude. And that is giving you an idea of the, the response that you would get. And this is in a relatively slow speed test. So if you went to a very high speed test, the magnitude and the response is much, much larger. Okay, so we've done a lot of work on looking at the silicas. We've put a lot of effort into understanding the different chemistries that go into stabilizing the materials to making the battery electrolyte to, uh, to, to being able to design what criteria are required to enable a shear thickening material, a shear thickening electrolyte. And so what you see here is a table of materials. So in the orange band, these are shear thinning materials. So these are all these fume silicas. And in the green band, these are the uh, shear thickening materials. And on the right side of this table, there is a plot of polydispersity, the light scattering methods, where we're measuring the average particles, the, the distribution in particle sizes. And what you'll notice is things that you have a very high polydispersity, so very wide ranges of particle sizes, they all shear thin. Whereas materials that have a very homogeneous size range, they all shear thicken. So what this data shows us is that colloidal particle homogeneity is critical to obtain the shear response. Now, from a scientific point of view, this is counterintuitive because many of the, the samples that shear thin in an aprotic solvent actually shear thicken in, in an aqueous solvent. So if you put these in water, they start to shear thicken. So the fundamental interactions between the aprotic electrolyte and the colloidal silicas are different than what you'd have from water and the colloidal silicas. Now, we've also done zeta potential measurements on these materials. So this is a measurement of the surface charge on the different species. So this is measured by applying a larger and larger voltage across something. And using Doppler shifts, you can measure the speed of the particles in, in the field. And so eventually, you'll find there is a voltage where things start to move. And that's related to the zeta potential on the material, which is a fundamental surface property. This is a plot that shows here zeta potential as a function of pH. Now, what you, in order to make a stable colloidal suspension or a, a suspension for, say, any sort of slurry casting, you need a zeta potential greater than plus or minus 30 millivolts. If it's greater than plus or minus 30 millivolts, you've got coulombic repulsions and things are stable in solution. If you have a, colloidal, a, a, a uh, zeta potential less than 30 millivolts, you don't have that coulombic repulsion and things tend to aggregate and precipitate out of solution. So what we see here, this is a data set that was collected. This is zeta potential data as a function of pH. And so I drew this black line in there arbitrarily. So above this black line, these materials all shin, sh or shear thin, sorry. And below this black line, they all shear thicken. So clearly, surface chemistry is important in order to obtain the maximum shear response. If it's not doesn't have a high zeta potential, it all starts to shear thin. And that is an important factor in order to stabilize these materials in the aprotic battery electrolyte. Sorry. Okay. So let's talk about the electrochemistry right now. So this is a plot here of ionic conductivity as a function of temperature for both the standard battery electrolyte in the that's used in all sorts of technologies and with the shear thickening electrolyte. And what you'll notice here, the, the black diamonds. That's the, sheer, the normal electrolyte. And so it has an ionic conductivity on the order of about uh, 1.2 millisiemens uh, per centimeter. In contrast, if you look at the shear thickening electrolyte in this generation one material, the ionic conductivity is slightly lower. And that's not surprising considering we are adding about 20 to 25 to 30 percent of the inorganic colloidal particles. So we're lowering the 
effective volume of the electrolyte, but uh, and but if you look at the slope of this curve, you find that the activation energy is the same. And so this is showing us that the transport mechanism through the electrolyte is the same, just our conductivity is lower because we've added inorganic filler to it. But this material still performs in a reasonable range in order to cycle batteries at rates of 2C. Um, anything above 2C, it does start to have a uh, negative impact on that performance. Okay, so now the interesting thing is this is a shear thickening material. And when you look at ionic conductivity, ionic conductivity is a function of viscosity. So when you have a material that's under normal shear state, or in normal conditions, like certain normal operations, it performs as a liquid. But when you go to a high shear rate, now the ionic conductivity drops like orders of magnitude. And what you'll see here on, is the plot on the right, where we have collected data uh, using, uh, we've collected data on materials using a rotating ring disk electrode, and you can measure the ionic conductivity. But once you get to the, around that 30% critical weight loading, where you get the maximum shear response, you'll notice that as you shear it, the ionic conductivity drops, and it drops significantly. And that's important because that improves our safety and performance of the battery because when you have a shear event, now ionic transport is cut off and you don't have, um, you don't have ions moving and you're not going to get that discharge of your battery. Okay, so we're also doing a lot of testing on these particular types of chemistry. So here I'm going to show you some examples of NMC, a third, a third, a third. So this is a third nickel, a third manganese, a third cobalt versus graphite. So these are full cells, not half cells. We don't have excess uh, lithium in there to make it work. We are using a material in these examples from Dreamweaver, which is a 70% or so, 65 to 70% porosity polyimide separator. Um, now, th there is an art to this. You can't just inject a shear thickening electrolyte because the act of injecting it causes it to stiffen and then it won't inject. So what we try to do is pre-position materials within the separator and then redisperse them with the electrolytes. And we develop processes in which to do this, and now that becomes a drop-in technology compatible with existing manufacturing processes. So what we show here, this is a set of duplicate cells that were run on a electrolyte that has 19.3 19 weight percent colloidal silica in the electrolyte. And what you'll notice here, this material was dried at room temperature with, um, in a vacuum. And what you'll notice is as we start cycling this material, the capacity decreases significantly, meaning that we're losing the cells, so there's a large irreversible capacity loss when you don't dry these things properly. But as you start to improve the drying, so this is some data that we, we collected where you dry the cell at 80 degrees C under a vacuum, and you'll notice that the irreversible capacity losses drop significantly. And in fact, if you take it to 100 degrees, it even you can get reproduce. You can get cycling out to 300 cycles without, uh, with very little loss of capacity. Capacity losses are on the order of a few percent. Um, we've done this for many, many cells. So drying is very important on the cycle, so that you don't. We think it's due to water, as well as enabling the surface termination of the silica to avoid bad chemical reactions. Um, and here's an example of something that was dried at 120 degrees. This particular cell had ended up cycling almost 300 cycles with, as you can see, very little loss of capacity as a function of cycle. Now, the other issue is how, if you can store these materials. So these are some pictures that were taken where you have the electrolyte that was dried. So the, the bottom number shows the temperature of the, that the silica was dried at. Then they were mixed away with the electrolyte and stored in an oven at 60 degrees C for two weeks. And you can see no discoloration and the electrolyte still remains as an electrolyte. So when you dry it properly, you can maintain electrolytes that can work at very high temperatures. Well, relatively high temperatures, 60 degrees C. Okay, so now let's talk about impact resistance. This is where the more exciting parts come in. We do a lot of testing here where we're going to take this, we call it the uh, brass ball test. And we have this three inch diameter brass ball that we're dropping at various points onto a battery. So this is a full cell battery, which is shown in the lower left picture, where we take a one centimeter stainless steel ball and place it on the stack. And then we drop that big brass ball onto the small battery. And then we are measuring it with a high speed uh, electrochemical test to look at the voltage shorts and transients. Uh, we had, for this program, it was originally designed for an RPE uh, 
vehicle technologies program, and it was designed to survive impacts of a thousand Gs. So we've done extensive testing on various materials and cells to, in order to understand the chemistry. And what you can see here on the picture on the left, this is a, a standard battery separator. And you can see there's a tear in the middle of it. That's related to where that particular material tore when the bat, when the small ball was impacted upon the, the, the separator and the cell, causing it to mechanically fail. Okay, so here are some data sets that were collected on multiple cells for things using a standard electrolyte and a standard battery separator. And what you'll notice here is that about 0.5 seconds, you'll see a transient where the voltage actually decreases, and then in some cases it returns to normal, or other cases it stays uh, in a lower voltage state. This is where you have a failure. So as you have that mechanical event, the separator is failing and the electrodes are touching, and that's causing the electrical short. Now, sometimes if they can bounce away from each other, you retain some of the voltage on the cell. But most of the time, the cells have failed. And we had many cells that actually caught on fire as we were doing this because of the energy that was released. Now, if you look at some of the shear thickening materials, I'm not going to say that we're perfect right now. But what we can see here is some data sets on the left that show that under some circumstances, we did not get perfect shear thickening response. But if you look at the cells on the center and the right, these materials showed no indication of uh, voltage spikes associated with that transient or very small voltage spikes associated with that transient because of the shear thickening response of the electrolytes. So that prevented the electrodes from touching each other and prevented the release of the energy and the loss in the voltage. So we've also done a lot of work on materials that were far from optimized. So these are some pictures of materials where we're using a peak mesh. So this is not a normal battery separator. Instead, this is only a mesh to keep the electrodes apart just for handling, but as and it's designed to fail, uh, and we expected it to fail catastrophically. And what we see here is we can actually make cells, we can cycle them. So again, this is cells that have cycled 100 cycles, and they can get normal. This is excellent capacity retention. But what we notice here, this is a, this is again the impact test. And in this peak separator, which has no mechanical performance uh, to it whatsoever, that when we have a cell, we've charged it to 4.2 volts. This is the red one is a sapphire or shear thickening cell. You can see there's a small transient, but the voltage immediately returns to where it's supposed to. In contrast, when we have this with a standard electrolyte, the cell shorts and we get a, a large discharge. So the, what this data shows is that when you, the shear thickening electrolyte is actually having a significant performance enhancement in terms of mechanical safety and, and impact resistance. But, and it's not an artifact of maybe we just got lucky with the separators. Now, we do a lot of testing on cells with thermal imaging. So this is a image of a standard battery with a standard electrolyte. This is again during our drop test. This is on the this is a test is on the order of four megajoules of energy onto the cell. You can see in this case you had the short, and you saw in this the, the figure shows the red areas are areas that the battery has increased in temperature from 23 degrees Celsius to 38 degrees upon the impact. Now, if we look at the shear thickening material, you'll notice this is on the same XY axis. That, that the area that is heated is much smaller. And furthermore, if you look at the temperature scales, it's only going to heat up to 33 degrees instead of the previous 38 degrees. So when you do have mechanical failure and you do have a short, then the heating that you get is actually much lower. So that prevents the risk of thermal runaway. And that's important to avoid the fires. Now, the reason it's lower heating is because when you add the inorganic silica particles to it, they are they have a higher heat capacity than the electrolyte and so it takes more energy to heat that that cell up and and so that prevents it from becoming the ther going into thermal runaway so just as a summary so we've demonstrated that we can use this material we can make this material we've demonstrated that you can this material has significant improvement in impact resistance and shorting we have preliminary data that would indicate it could stop a projectile because of the energy we're hitting the, the cells with 
and the scales that we're doing this, it, ha it could have significant impact performance benefits for things such as armor or electric vehicle for vehicles. Um, other applications where you need a battery on somebody or some place to avoid that you don't want to catch on fire in case it's hit with either a, a ballistic round or some other type of explosive force. Now we also have been doing work on current collectors. So the idea on this is to focus on developing a current collector that will break in a specific way. Instead of when you, when you get hit, you don't want your current collector just to shred and send little bits of metal into the electrodes causing shorts. We want it to actually break in a known and systematic function and isolate those areas that have been damaged. And so we have been designing current collectors that have specific failure points in them. So this is a simulation of the kinds of, of current collectors that we're designing that would be made out of aluminum or, or copper, where now your normal electrode is cast over this particular material. And in an event of an accident, or a, say it gets shot, you would break it in certain areas. And that would electrically isolate those areas that are damaged, and the other areas is still function. So we do a series of testing and evaluation of this using, uh, say, these mechanical probes. And we can clearly see, we, we can simulate the size. We can do, this is ballistic clay. We can simulate how much force is being applied onto these different foils. But what really is interesting is when you look at the battery. So here the picture in the middle is the modified battery. We've made a current collector with the preformed slits in it. And the one on the right has no preformed slits. And so you can see after a mechanical damage, the one that is a standard battery, it tears, it forms big, big, big clumps, it rips, and there's bits of shards that are pointing through. In contrast, if you look at the ones with the safe foil current collectors, it breaks off in nice little chiclets, and they are now electrically isolated and not exposed to the cell. So if we do a, a test, on that. So here we have a set of data where we have cycled a battery uh, for a period of time. Or no, this is a, a, the picture on the left is the cell during the mechanical test. And what you see on this modified battery is that you can maintain voltage on the cell, whereas the blue say, cell is after you do that event and you've ripped it apart, the voltage just immediately is, is lost because you created electrical shorts. So this isolating it main, after you've done the damage, main, you still get voltage out of the cell. And whereas if without this foil, then you lose all the voltage because of the electrical shorting. Now what's really interesting in my mind is this plot on the right, which shows the capacity performance of the material with the safe foils, uh, current collectors. So you, you cycle along normally at a regular state, uh, just like you normally would. But after you've gone through the mechanical event, you notice now that the, volt, the capacity of the cell drops in a stepwise function. And that stepwise function is directly related to the area that was mechanically damaged. So the benefit of this was to say if your cell was hit or shot, that area would become electrically isolated, but the other parts of the battery would function. So that would enable, say, a soldier to still perform their mission. They would, with, albeit at a lower capacity of their batteries, but they'd still have enough capacity in order to function and perform their mission out in the field, which is important because if you don't, if you have a damage and it's shorted the whole way through, then your battery is completely useless and they lose that power. Uh, we've done the same tests with various darts, and what you'll see here is in a standard battery on the left, when you have the dart, you increase temperature to 35 degrees because of the thermal runaway, whereas if you take our safe oil concept and you damage it, only the chiclet that was hit actually heats up. The rest of the battery stays quite small and the, the heating is incredibly localized and so you don't get a large amount of energy released at the same time. So I just, I'll wrap that up at this point, but what you can see is that there's a variety of multifunctional materials that would enable survivability and functionality to a potential soldier in the field. We're envisioning things where you could put these batteries in a vest and that would now function as, as giving you some ballistic performance. You could imagine putting, and that would also lighten the load on the soldier by being able to remove some of the ceramic armor. You could also um, uh, imagine this going into electric vehicle applications for, say, uh, troops in the field. 
where you don't want your batteries to catch on fire or give off heat in case they're damaged. And this would give you an extra set of armor around the vehicle. So that's all I have. All right. Well, we have already got a couple questions in, and uh, we will go through those. Please continue to type in if you have any. Uh, so, Dr. V, we have a question from Yi Ding. Uh, how high environmental temperature the battery can work with the described electrolyte? What is the cycle life of the battery with the electrolyte, and what are the disadvantages for the electrolyte? We've been able to perform experiments with the shear thickening electrolyte up to 60 degrees C. We, when you dry the silica at the right conditions, we can get 300 cycles of full charge discharge on a full cell. We did not go beyond 300 cycles because we needed the channels to go do other experiments. Uh, the major disadvantage of the electrolyte at this point is the high rate performance power. Uh, the ionic conductivity is slightly lower, so we cannot cycle at rates higher than 2C. But going at rates over 2C is oftentimes not a problem for specific applications. Or, uh, most things they charge at rates of C over 3, so it, it takes three hours to charge and three hours to discharge a cell. Um, so then a follow-up question, what is the self-discharge rate for the battery with the electrolyte? So we have measured, we've monitored the self-discharge rate. Since this is a full cell, if you form a stable SEI on the graphite, what you find is that the cells perform identically to other lithium ion batteries. We've got two similar questions and I'll combine them together. Uh, Barrett Tanner asks, what specific applications to the warfighter could the batteries be beneficial or offer improvement for? And Gregory Nichols asks, similarly, for b uh, vehicle batteries and whether that's possible. So I, I think for the warfighter, in terms of personal protection, you have a battery that may, that would theoretically offer some ballistic performance, where if you was shot, it would stop the battery or stop the bullet. Uh, similarly, if you could combine that with body armor, they would lighten the load on this soldier. So if you could take out, say, 10 pounds of ceramic armor and, and take out and be able to use the batteries in this place, you would lighten the soldier significantly. Uh, in terms of vehicles, you could imagine this being positioned around the outside of a vehicle and having some ballistic performance uh, associated with it. But I think more importantly, it allows you to reimagine where you'd put your batteries. Instead of putting your batteries in the most important and the most valuable space inside the vehicle where it's going to be safest from any sort of uh, uh, mechanical event to it, if you would, uh, now you can put it, say, outside on the bumper or on the sides where it's less valuable space and it gives you more functionality in your vehicle. Amber Powell asks, is low temperature cycling possible? And um, Gregory Nichols asks a similar question for cold temperatures. Uh, I would think so. We have not performed uh, low temperature cycling, um, but it, the ionic conductivity is the same. Uh, for, the activation energy of the electrolyte is the same as you would have with a, a normal aprotic electrolyte. So it goes to reason that you should be able to get low temperature performance out of these. I'm curious what the, and this is a layman's question, what's the relationship between the dividing of the battery, the chiclets that you talked about, and the electrolytes? So if you're thickening specifically. Imagine putting those together, that gives you an extra enhancement in the safety and performance. Okay. So those, the, the chiclet design could be applied to standard? Yeah, both of these are drop-in technologies that you Got could, it. with existing manufacturing processes, put in the separator with the colloidal particles, manufacture your cell, you could take new current collectors with the specially designed slits and then cast your electrodes on them just like you normally would and make new batteries without having to re-engineer the whole manufacturing process. All right, well, it looks like we've got a few more coming in. We'll give that just a second. Have you all tested it at altitude? We have not tested it at altitude. Well, 1,000 feet at Oak Ridge. Do you have any, so, any guesses for how it would do at, say, 13,000 feet? I am assuming it would, my guess is it would perform identically to other electro, the similar electrolytes and similar cells because we are not changing the ionic, the mechanism ionic transport. We're just changing some of the rheological properties. We have a question uh, regarding shelf life. So we've done some experiments. If you dry the colloidal particles correctly, 
They will stay in our glove boxes uh, for a year without any sort of discoloration in work. Um, but I, from what we can see so far is they have the same performance as a normal full cell battery, like a pouch cell or prismatic cell chemistries. Stuart Stahl asks, is there a disparity in weight? The addition of the colloidal particles adds about 1 to 2 percent to a 16 amp hour battery pack. Um, but you can offset that by being able to remove uh, other weights associated with the armor around it. Jane Rimple asks, are you limited to single layer pouch cells and can you vacuum fill or use a different electrolyte filling method? So we are not limited. We've made, uh, in my labs, uh, 0.5 amp hour cells. Uh, so that's, uh, I want to say, 10 to 15 uh, layers stacked together. Um, and you have to, you can still use the, the vacuum filling method where you evacuate it and then you add the, the aprotic liquid electrolyte, but you have to pre-position the colloidal particles. We have a few more coming in. Well, there we go. Um, oh, yes, we will make the slides available. They'll be available to download uh, both at the end of the presentation uh, and then tomorrow on our website as well. So I'm curious, we, uh, we had talked at the opening about the box or the brick-shaped batteries. What, uh, what potential is, are these to be built in kind of a conformal uh, or flexible manner? That's an excellent. So I think the bigger issue for making a conformal battery is the electrodes and how do you, because you can bend the separator in ways that will give you quite a nice uh, shape. So you could put it in a, a round, um, making hand gestures of making it something round, uh, say of a helmet. Um, but uh, the bigger issue would be mechanical properties of the uh, aluminum and current uh, aluminum and copper current collectors and the electrodes that are grown on or that are cast onto those and able to follow that shape. Uh, did the Department of Energy VTO support this work? No, it was funded by the Advanced Research Projects Agency, uh, RPE, um, out of the range program uh, led by Ping Lu and Sue Babinick. All right. Well, uh, if you have continued questions, please type those in. Uh, and while we wait on those, I want to give just a, an overview of a few of HCIX services. Uh, we offer a unique research support service that we call Technical Inquiry, or a TI. HCIX provides four free hours of analytical, scientific, and professional research on questions that fall within our eight focus areas. This service is available to academia, industry, and other government agencies. To initiate a request, please visit hdiac.org. We also offer what we call a Core Analysis Task Contract Vehicle, or a CAT. HDI CATs address challenging technical problems, including R&D, science and technology, and RDT and e issues that fall outside of our basic center of operations. The HDI CAT is pre-competed, so work can begin on a project in as little as six weeks once the statement of work is approved. CATs are customer funded and must be completed within 12 months. We have another follow up question from Gregory Nichols. Is there an optimal particle size for the SiO2 particles or does it not make much of a difference? There is an optimal particle size. We find it to be on the order of 200 nanometers and more importantly, the homogeneity. So if you have larger particles, you still get a shear thickening response, but there is an optimal size regime in terms of particle packing as well as being able to fill and use the pore spaces in the separate. So earlier you had mentioned some of the, the ball tests that you had run. Uh, I think four megajoules, you said, was yeah. the energy for oscillating. And again, what would you compare that to in terms of uh, something, an impact that we would recognize? That's uh, a car crash. A car crash. That, that's okay. a high energy car crash. Yeah. Stuart Style asks, what is your next phase of research to improve this technology? So we, the next phase of research is to make larger capacity cells, say five amp hours, and actually do ballistic testing on that. I mean, that's, that's where we need to go next to demonstrate the technology for these applications. What kind of range in megajoules would a ballistic test? Ooh, just an estimate. It's more than four megajoules. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 
what it is off the top of my head. Gotcha. But definitely the next step and the next advancing step. this. Good. Well, if anyone has uh, questions later, please let us know and contact us, and uh, we will put you in touch with an answer. And uh, with that, we will conclude our webinar, and we want to thank Dr. Deeth again, and thank you all for attending.